So today's session will be about reckoning with ourselves, developing skills to process and engage with difficult histories. We can go ahead and do introductions, though. Um, so my name is Caitlin Lamonti. I use the pronouns she and her and serve as the director for the Office of Inclusion Education within Student Affairs. Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor Bailey. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the assistant director of the UW-Madison Public History Project. And my name is Casey Lucini Butcher, and I'm the director of UW-Madison's Public History Project. Yes, clap for that, absolutely. Um, so we would like to start with a land acknowledgement. So the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the ancestral land that we're on today, is the home of the Ho-Chunk people, a place their nation has called a job since time immemorial. As an action within our shared future, it is our duty to recognize the land we are on, the role we play in the ongoing process of colonization, and the deep past and present actions that impact indigenous people in this place. As we continue unpacking who we are today in this presentation, we challenge you to reflect on how you can increase your knowledge and understanding of Native populations, learn the difficult truth of our history, and how we can move beyond acknowledgments and into action. For our session today, we have a few community agreements. Uh, we hope that you will be able to adhere to these as facilitators. We will also be keeping these in mind as we interact with you all. The first is to be aware of identities and positionality. So who you are matters. Those experiences, your identities, all of those are present with us every day. Uh, very present in our conversation today as we talk about emotions and how we move forward to get to action. Leaning into discomfort and challenging yourself to be engaged in this space. This is for you. This is your moment to really think about the work that you have before you, the ways in which you can utilize your sphere of influence and create change. So really allow yourself to fully participate in the conversations and the reflection today. Understanding intent and being accountable for impact. So we can have good intent, we can have intent to create community, to support students, to support one another, and our impact might still be problematic or harmful. It's important for us to be willing to be accountable and take action in order to address the impact we have on others. And finally, this is ongoing work, and it requires all of us to take action. So the conversations we'll have today is a starting point. We are not going to solve everything, not going to answer every question. This is merely a chance for us to engage, have this conversation, and think about what we can do after the diversity forum, so that it is not just one time a year that we engage in these, this work and these conversations. Um, a few learning outcomes. So the, the main outcome for us today is to really make sure that we are thinking about our emotions, how they show up, in particular when dealing with difficult histories. These might be histories that folks are encountering through the Public History Project, uh, viewing the exhibit and thinking about our past as an institution and what our future might look like. They might be personal histories that you are reckoning with through your family, chosen family, loved ones, community members, being able to uh, acknowledge our emotions emotions, process through them, and ultimately get to the point where we can hold those emotions at the same time that we are taking action and moving forward and not getting stuck in one moment or one emotion. Awesome. So we're going to give you a little background about the Public History Project. Many of you probably know a lot of this already, but if you don't, um, the Public History Project has this kind of sweeping thing besides the Sifting and Reckoning exhibit that we wanted to make sure all of you knew about before we get into some of the more difficult work. So starting right away, um, the founding of the Public History Project comes um, out of this page in the 1924 Badger Yearbook. In the 1920s, there were two student organizations on campus that bore the name of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, this was really common knowledge on campus for a long time. Um, the first real academic history about this came out in 1993 in the Wisconsin Magazine of History, but it wasn't until 2017 when then-Chancellor Rebecca Blank commissioned a committee of historians and community members to study the Klan's presence on campus in response, really, to the violence in Charlottesville. In this report, which is available online, there are multiple recommendations about what the university should do with this history. And one of the recommendations is a question. And the question is, by focusing so closely on these two student organizations in the 1920s, what are all of the other histories of discrimination that we're missing on campus? 
but also, and maybe more importantly, what are the histories of resistance that we're missing on campus? So the public history project was really born out of this study. Um, this is the first sentence in our mission statement. We aim to recover and acknowledge the history of exclusion on campus through the voices of those who experienced and resisted it. There are two things that make this project wholly unique in higher education, and that's in this country and in others. We don't believe that any other university is doing the work the way that we are doing the work here. The first is the scale and the scope of our project. So we look at 175 years of history and we look at multiple forms of discrimination. Lots of other universities that do this work, for example, Harvard, Georgetown, UVA, they've all looked at their specific histories with slavery, which is really important and it's a really important piece of reckoning, but it oftentimes allows them to ignore some of the other problematic histories that they have in their institutions. We decided to, you know, what I often say is go a mile wide, not a mile deep. So we wanted intentionally to try and represent as many people as possible and to tell as many stories as possible. So we look at racial and ethnic discrimination, but we also look at discrimination against LGBTQ folks, folks with disabilities, religious discrimination, gender discrimination, because we wanted this broad kind of set of information about the past of the university. The other thing that makes this project unique is our focus on the public and on public products. Mm -hmm. These other institutions that I mentioned, um, one of the main things that they do, like Harvard, is they put out very academic products like books or journal articles or reports. Um, these reports are 100 to 130 pages. So one of the things that I like to do when I give presentations like this is I will ask the room, I'll ask all of you online as well, if I gave you a 130 page report about UW-Madison's history, would you read it? And raise your hand if you would. Always a couple. I see, I see you, I see you fellow nerds. I'm right there with you. I read these for my job, um, so I've read a lot of these. Most of us though don't have time, right? All of you who didn't raise your hands, don't feel bad. It's a busy world, it's a busy time, there's a lot going on. These reports are very academic. It's just not how we really engage with the past often. And you know, there's all these questions about like, how do you even get the report? How do you know the report exists? We wanted to focus on the public and, and Taylor's gonna talk more about all of our products, but it was really important for us to think about how we could get this information to our campus community in multiple ways. The core of this project, it's a word that's in the title of our exhibit, is this idea of reckoning. It's also in the title of this presentation. So it, it takes a little time to unpack and I think it's worth unpacking. Reckoning is a big word, and it's a word that came up a lot when I first got here, and I would go around and I would meet with anybody who met with me. I met with a lot of you who were in this room, and I was you know, new to the university, and I was like, we're gonna do all these things, and lots of people laughed, <laughs> and lots of people were very supportive and said, I can't wait to see if you accomplish it. Um, and I would ask everybody the same set of questions, and the first question was, what history do you know? What, what do you think we should cover? And we got so many of the research stories from those conversations. The second thing was, you know, in 10 years, 20 years, 15 years, 30 years, how is UW different because we did this project? In an ideal world, what's, what's different about UW? And a lot of people came with the word reckoning. They were like, we need to have a reckoning. And I think one of the things that underlies reckoning is this idea that you know the history is there, whether we recognize it or not. But if we tell it, if we bring it out into the open, we can begin that active work of reckoning. So this is the dictionary definition of reckoning. There are three definitions. I take these around a lot. And at the project, we've come to view them as a step-by-step -step process. And I think that the process of this, you will see as directly mirroring what Caitlin's gonna talk about, which is why we came up with this um, panel. So the first is that you process or calculate or estimate or you learn something, right? So as the project, we've been researching and calculating and estimating where is discrimination happening? Who is it happening to? How are resistance movements forming? We release that history in a lot of different ways, whether that's the exhibit or through our blog posts. And when that happens, people have views and opinions and judgments and feelings about that history. And that is an important part of the historical process. It is not a a thing that we leave a lot of space for in our culture. And I think that's where you see a lot of the tensions around history is that we don't have good spaces to talk about these issues and to process and unpack and to ultimately reckon with them. Obviously, if I tell you something new about the past or about this institution or about your neighborhood or your community or your family, you're going to have feelings about that. It's about what do we do with those feelings? And that's really what today's panel is about. And finally, 
in, in an ideal world, there is a bill or an account or a settlement. And when I, when I use this definition, sometimes people get a little scared. They're like, money? Maybe. Um, but also, it could be a lot of other things, right? But the main thing is that we do something. And I think this is kind of fundamental to public history as a practice, but I think it's more fundamental and important to history generally. We don't get a gold star for just learning about the past. It's about what we do with the information that we learn. So that third step is really about doing. So I'm going to hand it over to Taylor L. Bailey, my assistant director, and I don't get a lot of public forums to talk about Taylor, so I just want to take a second. Um, Taylor started as a graduate student on the project. Um, I have purple hair, and so I'm very noticeable. So when I go around, a lot of people talk to me, and I am blessed to be the face of this project. None of this would have happened without Taylor. She was there from day one when we laid out the exhibit. <laughs> She is my partner in crime and um, truly really, really blessed and grateful that when Taylor graduated, she accepted my offer to be the assistant director. So I'm going to pass it over to you. Wow. <laughs> that was very nice. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit about our products um, that we kind of focus on at the UW-Madison Public History Project. And the first and pretty much the shiniest one that we have is our exhibit, Septuagint and Reckoning, UW-Madison's History of Exclusion and Resistance, which is on view right now at the Chazen Museum of Art. So if you don't, you didn't get a chance to view it, um, it is open and on view until December 23rd, free and open to the public. So please go and see the, the physical exhibition. And we're really grateful to our uh, partners at the Chazen as well for um, opening up their space to have an exhibit like this to talk about these issues and kind of be forefront with these issues um, and these kind of different historical exhibits that they usually don't house because they focus on art. So very thankful for them. The next one is our digital exhibition website. So um, if you didn't get a chance to see the exhibition in person, you can um, explore the exhibition online as well. Our digital exhibition website has everything that we have in the gallery, plus even more. So we have over 300 uh, archival assets. That's uh, oral history clips, um, videos, um, things that have been digitized, so any of the documents or objects that you see in the exhibition, all of those are kind of replicated on our um, digital exhibition website, which is really cool. We even uh, kind of utilize the space to even amplify some of the histories that we, uh, due to logistical reasons, were unable to have in the physical exhibition space. So you get even more sometimes than you can get kind of perusing through the physical space. Um, and I kind of want to highlight as well that we, we link to kind of our long form blog posts that go in depth a lot about a lot of the themes that we talk about in the exhibit and a lot of instances um, that happened on campus in the past, um, recent past and kind of very distant past that kind of really digs into um, the research that our student researchers were doing while the project was under research. Um, and we also have links to pretty much all of our citations. We have over 400 citations for the exhibition. So if you are kind of embarking or you're teaching a class where students are embarking on research projects, it can be a resource to see what boxes we pulled or what documents we looked at when we were um, curating the space and researching these histories. And then we also have a full suite of curricular materials. We really wanted to focus on how do we get everything that we've learned and things that we have dug into the archive to find out into um, our classrooms, right? This is an institution of higher learning and we really wanted to have this project and the exhibition to be um, a tool for others to teach and to learn. So we do have uh, teaching guides on our public history project website. You can go to the resources page um, and access those. And those guys are, we have 10 in total. Nine of them are um, themed for, or 
kind of cre craft it after the themes of the exhibition. So you can go and kind of peruse if you're teaching a class on um, the black student strike, for example, you can go and look at that specific teaching guide. Our last teaching guide is actually crafted after the Go Big Read this year, how the word is passed. We were very thankful to be partners with Go Big Read this year um, to welcome Clint Smith to campus and kind of talk about historical reckoning on a larger level while we're kind of reckoning at this local level. So these are really good um, ways to get that information into classrooms, but also to book clubs and things like that. It includes primary sources, secondary sources, um, discussion protocol, uh, discussion questions, things like that. So you can really t take whatever you need in an a la carte way. Um, and we also do have a full events and lecture series. These are two of our past events that happened this week um, for our partnership with the Diversity Forum. Yesterday we were able to bring NPR's Throughline podcast hosts um, to have a conversation around the project and the, the act of doing this kind of historical reckoning. Um, and we've had a bunch of different uh, events kind of leading up into this. We love to partner with especially student organizations and different uh, departments and unit across campus to really think about how we can integrate this history in a very institutionalized way. Um, so all of our, we did actually host a lot of events while the campus was locked down, while we were uh, completely remote. So if you go to our Public History Project website, you can look, kind of look at all of the events that we hosted because they were recorded, fortunately. So you can kind of catch up to what we have been doing um, up until this point before we had in-person events. We do have a, another event. Obviously, the uh, exhibition is closing uh, next month, unfortunately. But we do have an event that um, is going to be hosted by the WFAA, their Spotlight Series. So if you would like to um, join in on that event, you can kind of, I think they might have it on the WFAA website, so you can go and register that way as well. And that will be December 6th. Um, in terms of our lecture series, we do a lot of going around campus, talking about the project, talking about the history and how people can use it as a tool to kind of craft a better campus environment and community here. So I go around and I talk to a lot of actual classrooms, get student perspectives of how they're processing the things that we talk about in the exhibition. But we also have been doing a lot of talks with departments and units, thinking about how on that um, more institutional level Level, the history can be used as a tool to create better policies, and just a better welcoming, more inclusive and equitable environment. And finally, <laughs> this is Casey, Casey laughs because we kind of talk about how much reports are not utilized by our campus community, but we will be producing a report still. <laughs> You can't so, break all academic habits, I'll yeah. just say that. <laughs> um, and so we, obviously, most of our products are kind of public fo focusing, and we wanted to figure out a way to make the report a kind of public focusing as well, like focusing on that community aspect. So whereas a lot of reports for projects like these are very academic, very long, um, talking about the, the research and what was found, we're gonna use our report space to really um, be innovators in this work and utilize it as a process document for other institutions who may want to do projects and exhibitions like ours. So we can really give a step-by-step -step process about how exactly we went about doing the work, what our funding structures were like, things like that that really give people a step-by-step -step process on how you can go about cra crafting these projects and what kind of resources are needed. Um, yeah, so I'll turn it back over to Casey. Yes. So back to reckoning, um, only because I think sometimes we talk about reckoning and we, you know, we throw this big, huge academic word out there and it seems very nebulous. I actually really enjoyed when Clint Smith was here. He talked about the word reckoning because it's in the subtitle of his book. 
And he said that it works on so many layers, right? There's individual reckoning, there's community reckoning, there's this larger collective reckoning. Um, but when you learn, I think, more about the public history and what we're trying to do about at the public history project, it makes a little more sense, right? We could have hid this all in a book. We could have put it in a report. And maybe a few people would have read it and they would have gotten a lot from it and it would have changed their behaviors or their actions or maybe it would have changed a department policy. But we took this approach really geared at how do we bring everyone along with us, right? How does reckoning happen at multiple layers throughout the campus community? And so today in our, in our kind of panel and in our conversation, we wanna get at what we think is a really powerful mode, which is this individual reckoning. And to do this work, to, do, to get to step three, which is the action piece, we have to first do that reckoning within ourselves. Um, and when Caitlin and I were talking about the project, I mean, Caitlin's one of the first people I met with on campus. Um, and we've been talking about reckoning since then. And when the diversity forum came up, we knew that this was something we really wanted to do. So I'm gonna pass it over to Caitlin and we'll start reckoning within ourselves. Uh, fun fact, so when Casey first sent me a Teams message about this session, I was back home in Gainesville, Florida, cleaning out my mom's house and reckoning with my own family's history. So when she sent me that message, I was like, does she know where I am? Does she know what I'm going through right now? Um, so yes, skills that I was able to use both at home in my personal life as well as at work. So this next section, we'll talk about embracing our feelings. So I know for some folks, you're probably like, I don't want to do that. That is my worst nightmare, talking about emotions. I'm at work. I do not want to talk about my feelings. And I know that on the other end of that spectrum, there are probably folks that sharing your emotions might be a, a true way in which you connect and build community and a way in which you process a lot of the experiences that you're having. Uh, the most important part is that we all have emotions. We have feelings. Uh, when we encounter new people, new experiences, our emotions are with us. Being able to recognize that, embrace those emotions, and again, process and recognize with them is a huge piece of not being able to get stuck sometimes in an emotion and move us closer to be doing uh, that final part of action and being able to create change and move forward. Um, so speaking of emotions, there are a lot. When I was doing some research on this session, um, looking at different emotion wheels and way of using words to describe how I'm feeling, I'm like, huh, this is a, a good word for me to use when I'm reflecting on how my day went instead of my typical, I'm fine, I'm okay. Um, so thinking about emotions, when I first went to the Sifting and Reckoning exhibit, I felt pretty much all of these emotions on this emotion wheel. Um, I felt relief and gratitude that our campus was finally talking about this history and the impact that we've had on students, staff, faculty, community members throughout the years. I felt a deep sense of trust in the work that Casey and Taylor and their team have been able to do in bringing these stories to light. I also felt anger and disappointment and frustration that so many have been harmed, oppressed, and further marginalized while being at this institution and for the role that I play within that. Um, finally, I felt a lot of joy, joy in the resistance and persistence that folks have shown in a refusal to be silenced, in a refusal to accept that this is just what it is. I cycled through all of those emotions when I visited the exhibit. Um, I cycle through those emotions sometimes on a typical day at work. Uh, what I have been able to learn throughout my life and my different experiences is the importance of being able to recognize when those emotions are coming forward in me and not just push them away, um, being able to sit with them and process with them. If you ask uh, my supervisor, he might say that I'm uh, less reactive now because I've been doing this work around trying to really process how I'm feeling and what is maybe triggering those feelings and how I can use those emotions, those responses in order to move me closer to action and understanding rather than just constantly pushing them away and trying to not engage with them. I wanted to share a few of the quotes um, that had particularly strong emotional responses for me that almost caused me to stop and disengage from the exhibit uh, as a way of modeling some of the work that I'm currently doing and possibly something that you all have felt as you reckon with uh, the university's history as well as maybe your own personal histories. Uh, so this first quote um, was something that I encountered uh, fairly early when I was moving through the exhibit. So it is a quote by Lewis Henry Richardson, the second black football coach in the Big Ten and the first black assistant coach of any sport at UW-Madison. His quote reads, 
Coaching at the University of Wisconsin was nothing like I envisioned. In fact, I liked coaching. I did until I coached at the University of Wisconsin. I never envisioned the humiliations and the non comradeship I endured as an assistant football coach. They were the most miserable days of my entire life. I never experienced anything that demeaning and unprofessional as I endured as a football coach at the University of Wisconsin. It's difficult for me to say, but it's the truth. So when I read that quote, I felt like time slowed down a bit. My stomach felt uneasy, my body felt warm and uncomfortable, and I was ready to go. Uh, I was angry, I was frustrated, I was disappointed. My emotional response in that moment was so strong, in part because I have felt these things at various points within my past five years at the institution. I have been tested in ways that I did not uh, imagine coming to Wisconsin and working at UW-Madison, and I've had moments where I have questioned um, if this was a place for me to be able to not just be, but to thrive and truly succeed. Feeling that emotional response knew, uh, alerted me that I was reacting strongly for a reason, that it was triggering memories I have at the institution, it was triggering a larger conversation that I needed to have with myself about my place at the institution, the work that I'm doing in ways in which I can ultimately take care of myself. Um, all of that came up within reading this quote, five minute time span. My first most honest reaction when I read the quote again was to want to disengage and pull back and that was enough processing for today. I had to really push myself to continue thinking about this quote in particular, think about what it was bringing up within me and what it meant for me moving forward. Another quote in which I had a really strong emotional response uh, was from a recent graduate of UW-Madison, Juliana Bennett. Their quote said, they got people of color to come here, but they didn't make it a welcoming place for us to want to stay here. When I first read this quote, I felt sadness, deep sadness that this is often the everyday experience of students of color and other students holding marginalized identities. I felt conflicted and even a bit guilty about my role in this institution as a staff member and questioned if I was able to do enough to truly create change and belonging for students of color. I also felt pride. So again, pride in knowing that Juliana and so many other students refused to be silenced, refused to accept less, and that they continue to hold us all accountable as members of this community. I share these quotes in my own emotional responses to model that I too am processing emotions and strong reactions to facing the truths and lived experiences shared within these difficult histories of our institution and of our community. And to hope that possibly, like me, you are willing to move forward to process your emotions so we don't get stuck within them and never get to the po potential of us creating change. While I cannot go back and change the experience that Les or Juliana had, I can be a part of the present and the future. The exhibit materials for a future public history project of 2075 um, are being created today in this very moment with all of us as uh, members of this community. We have the potential to process our emotions, to move through them, to hold them with us, and ultimately create a different history, a different story, a different lived experience moving forward. So that at a future diversity forum, when folks are talking about another public history project, possibly the quotes being shared are very different. And and the impact and the emotions that are uh, being brought forth in folks might be more focused on joy and celebration and pride in the growth and work that the university has done. To get us there, I want to name a few things about emotions that I think are, for myself, things that I've always known, but I oftentimes will try to shy away from or not acknowledge fully. So the first is that emotions are a natural human response as we process information and lived experiences. I feel that in my experiences as a multiracial black woman, I'm often told or socialized that I shouldn't be emotional at work. That if I'm upset about anything, I then fulfill that stereotype of being an angry black woman. So I try to push away my emotions, I don't wanna acknowledge them, I don't see them as bringing value to my understanding of the work I'm doing. So I have to actively push against that and unlearn that to recognize that all of us have emotions, we're all feeling, we're human, and that is okay. Those emotions are valid and important. 
We're also going to show up differently for different people based on our identities and experiences. My joy might look different than your joy. My sadness, my anger, those things are going to be different depending on my identities, my experiences, the very folks I'm in a space with. That is okay that my emotions might show up differently compared to someone else's. Also thinking about how emotions are temporary and they're going to shift and change over time. This has been key to me being able to process my emotions and ultimately move forward. Just because I am angry in a moment does not mean I'm always going to feel that anger. Just because I am sad, just because I feel frustrated or unable to um, move forward, that is just temporary. My emotions are going to shift and change just as I am going to. And then finally, emotions can be identified and they can be understood. If we stop trying to constantly push them away and hide them and not acknowledge them, we can understand ourselves and our response. Um, I know when I am going to be nervous, my stomach might feel like butterflies. I know how my body feels when I am getting angry and feel like I'm being silenced in a meeting. I'm able to better listen to my emotions and my mind and my body and those reactions, and that helps me to get to a greater point of understanding. It helps me to then uh, be able to share my ideas in a different way, to understand what I have uh, the capacity to then engage in. So it's important for us to recognize that those emotions we're feeling are an important part of the the way in which we understand, and ultimately the way in which we create change. Which leads us to developing skills. Um, so I want to say that all of the skills, all of the strategies that I'm going to mention that we will talk about together are things that likely you have already encountered or things you might have heard. Sometimes it truly takes a moment of deep engagement and being intentional about those skills to recognize the growth that we might have to do and the new ways in which we can learn how to bring those skills about into our everyday practice. So some strategies. First is to increase your own awareness of your emotions and how they show up in your body and mind. You have to start with the self. I have to understand how I am when I'm angry so I can understand the possible impact on other folks within my space. So I can understand how anger might really be my body responding to feeling left out or not heard or judged. I have to know how those emotions play out for me. Recognizing that when you're having an emotional response and identifying those emotions present for you. So is it really anger or is it sadness? Is it frustration? Is it disillusionment? Taking the time to identify exactly what you're feeling and then embracing those emotions. So again, allowing yourself to feel. It is okay when you are going through the exhibit, when you read a quote uh, shared by someone about pain and suffering, you should feel sad. It is important that we're recognizing those emotions and what they are telling us about the situation we are trying to understand. Investigating what that trigger might be or what the cause of the emotion is. So is it because I am feeling uh, connected with one of my own lived experiences? Am I feeling maybe that I didn't take accountability? What is coming up for that emotion? And then finally, creating space to continue feeling your emotions and thinking about what moving forward looks like. So I am very much a both and type of person, never either or. So I can feel my emotions deeply and I can think about action. I can feel my emotions deeply and move towards reckoning. It is okay to hold both of those. I just have to do the work to prepare myself to process emotions at the same time that I am still thinking about change and action and moving forward and reckoning. The questions that I typically will cycle through when I am trying to process my emotions, especially in response to a difficult history or difficult truth in which I might be accountable or a part of. So what am I feeling? What caused those feelings? What do I want to do about these feelings? Am I looking for action or do I just need to simply process more? How can I process and understand these feelings? And then what actions do my feelings call, call me to consider moving forward? Right? So when I'm reading a quote from a student who's been harmed, as a staff member here, what action am I being called to do? How can I intervene? How can I create change? How can I use possibly my position and power to do something different within my sphere of influence? So using these questions as a framework to start to process and understand your emotions more. Important things to remember as you engage in this work. First, you are not alone in this. 
Um, using the power of being in community to consider processing with someone and supporting their emotional experience as well. Always important to first ask someone if they have capacity and space to engage in emotional processing with you. Not just assuming that because this person is your friend or a colleague that you can go and kind of vent or dump on them, recognizing that they might be going through their own emotional response and processing as well. This is ongoing work, so you, the more you practice processing emotions and making them a key piece of the ways in which you move throughout the university, encounter work, create change, the easier it's going to be. Uh, when I think about my ability to be accountable, possibly for harm that I've caused, Caitlin of today uh, has a strategy for being accountable and recognizing my impact and creating change. That is very different than Caitlin of 15 years ago, who would have been much more defensive and stuck in that emotion. The more I practice the more I felt more comfortable and confident in being able to do that work. And finally, self-care is a critical part of this. Uh, taking care of yourself, your community, is also how you are able to better process emotions and recognize what is coming up for you and ultimately get to action. There are times, um, so for example, when I went to the exhibit that first night, I did not get on social media and scroll through the latest CNN reports and all of those things. I was already kind of flooded with information and questioning my place within the institution and the change that needed to happen, but I did not have space or capacity to let even more information about the world and the work that we need to do as a larger society in. So being aware of some boundaries that you might need to set for yourself, what your capacity is, how even throughout doing this difficult work of trying to reckon, you can still celebrate and find joy and take a break and treat yourself, that that self-care is also a key piece of this work. And I'll just add to that, we've been talking a lot, um, the earlier talks were discussing how to make more welcome in environments on campus. I think so much of that is just allowing more space for emotions to be present um, and for people to process emotions. All of us are doing different work. Um, we all have different end goals, but what does it look like to make spaces like intentionally more welcoming um, and be able to sit with those emotions at work, at school, um, in department and unit meetings, right? To make people feel more comfortable with processing and engaging with those emotions on just a regular basis. And we also, a lot of, one of the most common questions that we get besides, you know, how did you do the work like logistically is how did you and Taylor and your graduate students and undergraduate students like emotionally do the work? Um, and so sometimes I think, you know, we have spent a year with the exhibit before anybody ever saw it. We had a year to spend with the exhibit. We had multiple years to spend with this history. So it sometimes appears that like it doesn't emotionally affect us anymore. And it's because we've done a lot of this emotional processing work already, right? Like I very vividly remember the only time I've ever cried in an archive was reading the gay purge papers. I literally started crying in the archive. I had to, I just stopped working for the day, right? I took the time to walk away from the space and also to hold myself about the action that I was gonna do, which is that I had to go back and finish reading those papers, that it was my job as the public historian here, but also as somebody who cares deeply about the queer community to bear witness to this, to bear witness to this suffering, quite frankly, and to make sure that other people knew about it so that we could have these conversations, so that action could happen. Um, but that was emotional work that, I mean, that happened three years ago. So it looks very different for us now at this point in the process. And we have talked about publicly before too, the ways that we encouraged our students to take time for themselves, not only as, because our students are very busy. So, you know, we get lots of emails from students that are like, I'm sorry, I can't work, I have a midterm. Yes, obviously you can't work, don't worry about it. But also students who said, you know, I just can't go to the archives this week. I just cannot read another newspaper article about how bad this institution is. I just can't do it today. So really give students that space to, okay, then walk away. You need to take that time for yourself. So sometimes I think it looks like we are almost unfeeling about these histories or when we talk about them, we deliver them in a way that seems that way. And it's only because we did a lot of this years ago because we we're much further along in the process. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, and being able to let folks be wherever they are in the process, right? So that we might have a different understanding and we have come to a, a point where we're able to engage with the materials and the history different. That doesn't mean that everyone is there yet. That doesn't mean that our students are necessarily there yet. And that is okay. Still allowing spaces, uh, in particular for trying to create those welcoming and inclusive spaces, making sure those spaces allow students to show up authentically, um, whether that is with anger, sadness, questions, questioning, doubt, uh, disbelief that things are going to change, letting them still show up um, and not trying to force them or put them into a box and how they're supposed to be feeling uh, in terms of the work that we're trying to do together. Want to give you all the opportunity to uh, reflect and unpack a bit. So have some questions that we will ask you to consider um, that we will also consider and then share out some of our responses to. Uh, so what is listed are a few different questions around emotions, some of them dealing with if you have already been able to experience the sifting and reckoning exhibit, um, some that are more general so that even if you have not had that experience yet, you can still consider how you are in touch with your emotions and the work you have to do. So the first question, what barriers exist that prevent you from acknowledging your emotions? What resources or support do you need to embrace and process emotions? What action can you take to create new histories and impact the present and future? What emotions did you experience when viewing the sifting and reckoning exhibit? And then what stories prompted you to have an emotional response? Why do you believe these stories impacted you? What actions do these emotions and stories motivate you to take or to do? So I would ask for folks to have a discussion at their tables and for folks joining us remotely um, to utilize the chat feature and put in any responses that they're reflecting on or take maybe five minutes or so, um, for folks to have a conversation at their table about uh, reflecting on their emotions and any responses to these prompts. All righty, let's go ahead and wrap up. And we'll have time to share what folks discuss at their tables, if people feel comfortable. I do have a couple from the virtual space that I'm gonna read out. So the first one that was submitted virtually, it says, my biggest barrier to acknowledging my emotions is that I'm an empath. I put up walls early on in many experiences to protect my mental health, and I will stew on something for days if I don't shut down, which I feel like a lot of people can relate to. It's very easy to um, feel that way and want to shut down and respond. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, the next one that was submitted virtually, the story that elicited an emotional response I was not prepared for was the pipe that was passed on from class to class, the pipe of peace. Um, as someone who loves tradition and ceremony as a way to build community, I reflected on how my own participation in traditions have pe perpetuated harm. Yeah, that was a really great one. It's really about deliberating what our like stance is and, and kind of replicating these things that we don't want to be replicated. Um, I'll share one last one and then we'll see if folks from the room want to share. Um, one story that prompted me to have an emotional response was the story of the black female athlete who was attacked in broad daylight. I was sad, disgusted, and fearful. I have since brought my teenage children to the exhibit so they can be aware of our history and how it informs our present. Thank you for sharing those. And so yeah, if, if folks wanna talk about what they discussed at their tables, I think we have someone with a mic. We do have a mic runner, so raise your hand if you're bold and brave. Hi, my name's Jay. Um, something that came up at our table was this feeling of like enormity, when there's so many things happening and it can feel really daunting. And the word that got used was like stuck, like where do I even begin with this work? And um, a piece of advice that I got from a former mentor was like, pick something and care about it really hard and like put all your focus into that. For me, that was like trans activism when I was an undergrad. And so I cared really hard about that and that led me to learn about the intersections with race and disability and I started to like expand my knowledge. And that was a really, really powerful thing that mentor gave me was like, 
pick something and care about it really hard. Um, if you're like feeling stuck by this like enormous thing, this nebulous like oppression happening everywhere, is to pick one thing. That's so good. That's such good advice. That's incredible advice. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emily. Um, so my table and I, my partner, <laughs> um, we kind of um, talked about like the barriers and resources and how they're kind of um, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, so like the barriers that kind of um, exist that um, prevent us from acknowledging our emotions are like an uncomfortable space and people who aren't willing to listen and have those difficult conversations with us. And so um, then on the other end of that is the resources that we need and the, um, the tools that we need. So that would be an open and welcoming space um, for us to have those conversations. Um, and um, one of the chairs of the DEI committee that I'm part of in our department says, um, step into this space and be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, it's okay to slip up, um, but that shows that you're trying, and I think acknowledging that you're trying is a big thing. Um, and so the barriers and resources are kind of go hand in hand for me. Thank you for sharing. Hello. Um, I feel like in our table, we kind of got vulnerable over here, but... Um, just to speak for myself, I was kind of wearing my administrator hat. And, you know, I th we all, I think, talked about how we process emotions differently internally. And so they don't always rise to the surface the same way. Um, but the barriers that exist, I think, in the admin hat is, like, my heart immediately goes out to the students and the folks I'm supposed to be advocating for. So it's almost like a suppression of, I don't have time or energy to feel it right now because what I feel is only magnified by people who don't have the decision-making power I have or the advocacy or platform that I have. And so kind of that barrier. Um, and also just thinking that there's still a workplace kind of environment where sometimes emotions can be seen as weak. And I know everyone in this room is so above thinking that, but it's, it's still there. You don't want to be perceived as weak by your colleagues for feeling something. So. Thank you for that. There was also a, a virtual one that came, just came in that kind of speaks to what you were talking about. It says, my role as a supervisor has become a barrier to acknowledging my own emotions at work and allowing myself to process my emotions with colleagues. I feel an expectation to engage in or lead processing discussions, but that as a supervisor, it isn't okay to show vulnerability. So that kind of intersection between having a, a position in leadership and being able to uh, adequately and kind of honestly show emotion, but allow space for others to process as well. Anyone else wanna share? First and foremost, I wanted to thank you for the work that you've done and the work that you continue to do. Um, admittedly, I have not gone to see the exhibit yet. Um, and the main reason I haven't is, is complex, but in, in kind of bringing it down to the bare bones, I have a deep family history rooted on this campus on my mother's side of the family. I also have a biological deep side of the other side of that coin that reflects the opposite experience. And so I'm planning on going before it disappears because I love to see things in person. But the, con the conflict is daily. And one of the things we talked about at this table is that the, ne the neck muscles that folks who are typically marginalized, underrepresented, in displays and exhibits like yours aren't the shaking of the head, but the nodding of the head. Going through daily and seeing the things that we see every day and hearing the things that we hear every day and struggling with the things that we struggle with every day and the weight that that creates and continues to be held by folks 
who shake their heads up and down instead of side to side is significant. We have very strong neck muscles, very strong back muscles, and very thick legs mm -hmm. from carrying that weight on a daily basis. And so I think that's something that folks need to, to continue to acknowledge. Um, another interesting quote, and I, I, I don't want to bring too many movies into these spaces, but there's a movie series that starts with the A and rhymes with Schmashmengers <laughs> that uh, uh, one of the characters, they say, you know, how is it that you keep from getting angry? And his quote was, no, you don't, you got it wrong. I'm angry all the time. Mm -hmm. That's how you keep it under control. Mm -hmm. And that is fatiguing. That is exhausting. And I think that to that point, thank you so very, very much for what you've done. But when people who are not in these positions in these spaces, walking these lives daily, walk out and they themselves say, I couldn't do it all in one take, or I was absolutely exhausted, I was emotionally drained. And, and a line that one of my colleagues use quite regularly is, welcome, we have cookies. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to share that. And sometimes we have to get the crumbs on ourselves in the process of processing these things. So thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's my job to say you should all go to the exhibit, but one thing we talked about a lot in our team discussions was how we could make the information accessible for when people are ready. So if people do not end up making it to the physical exhibit, it will still be available to them because we want people to come to it when they're ready because we knew it was going to be challenging for people. We also knew that some people wouldn't physically be able to make it to the gallery, right? Maybe they're not in Madison anymore, they're out of the country, other things like that. And so thank you for sharing that. I think you are not alone in that experience. There are a lot of people who want the information and want to see it and are struggling with, with when they feel ready to do that. And I also think there is an expectation, especially we've heard from a lot of voices, that there was an expectation that folks who have had similar experiences that we put on display in the exhibition would feel shocked or surprised by any of it. And I think that we have seen, especially when talking to marginalized students, um, that they feel the opposite, kind of like what you're, you're getting at, right? Not, these experiences are maybe not their direct experience, but there are experiences that they can relate to or feel validated by. Um, so kind of we, we always talk about not assuming what people are going to feel or how they're going to respond to things, but allowing people to make that decision of their own, right? Because marginalized people have had these uh, discriminatory instances on campus. Um, it's important for us to kind of reassert or reimagine what that agency looks like and retelling that story too. So allowing people the space and opportunity to process or to have emotional responses when they're ready. Including yourself. So uh, part of my role sometimes involves processing spaces for students and supporting those or facilitating them. And so in knowing that I would likely have a strong emotional response to viewing this exhibit, I've been a few times myself so that I could process through my emotions before I then try to do that for students. Not wanting to just unload on them or not being able to support them. So taking that time for yourself, even if it means it's, you know, you're going back three, four times, you're going through the website, you're giving yourself smaller moments to engage, that is also fine and okay in order to be able to get to a point where you're willing to and able uh, to do some of that reckoning. It's going to take time. That is fine. There is enough time for us to do that. Okay, if no one else wants to share out, we will move to some question and answer. So questions can be about content we covered, can be about the exhibit, can be about additional opportunities to engage. Um, Taylor is kind enough to read some of the uh, remote questions for us, so we'll also be incorporating them into the questions from the audience here. Yes, I will start with the first one I see. It says the exhibition closes next month, but will the website remain up indefinitely? Yes. <laughs> as, much as, as much as you can say a website will remain indefinitely. Um, one of the kind of complicating factors is that the public history project was conceived of as a short-term project. So it was always conceived of as like a limited, finite thing. So currently the public history project is set to end in July of 2023. 
Um, we're in ongoing conversations with the university about what it looks like to continue the project and continue doing the work, but nothing has been confirmed yet. Um, and so as long as we're here, we want to keep doing the work, right? We want to keep having these conversations and making the history accessible. Um, and the website will continue to live on even if the public history project does not. Um, we know at least for, you know, a few years, you know, um, it is under the purview of marketing. The wonderful university marketing team made our website and it's so beautiful. Beautiful, um, and so they will continue to kind of foster it. Oh, do we have over it? here? Okay. Yes. yes. Hello. <laughs> um, so I've had the pleasure of hearing Casey speak at other things, and Taylor, so nice to see you. I've heard wonderful things. <laughs> Thank um, you. So uh, related to that a little bit, my question is: um, What recommendations are you putting forth, if any? You talked about starting this project with the Ku Klux Klan, and that came with a recommendation, and that's how this other larger project came from. So, is there something you know in that boring report you're writing um, that has recommendations that maybe the continuation of this project could lead to, or elsewhere around the university could pick up and, and continue your work? Our report is gonna be so interesting and entertaining, first of all. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I always talk about with reports, it's like, who is it for? And so I tell students about the report and I'm like, it's not for you. Like, if you read it, you're absolutely welcome to, but I expect zero students to read it. It really is for like other higher ed folks who wanna do institutional history projects, or other museum folks who wanna do institutional history projects. So we will have a lot of, I think, kind of recommendations in there for just how to do this work better, right? There were some like structural parts of the project that were really difficult for us. One of them being that the project was short term. So one of the things I think you see in the exhibit and in a lot of our research is that, you know, we felt that this was our one shot. This was our one opportunity to talk about these histories and these issues. And so we crammed a lot of information into that gallery and into the gallery book and into the website because it almost created this like feast or famine mentality where we had no choice but to tell every story now because we had a lot of very serious conversations about if we don't tell a history now, will it ever get told? Because what if they don't do a public history project for 20, 30, 40 years again? Um, and so like some of those things will be in there. As far as recommendations for the university, um, no. <laughs> we were asked not to provide formal recommendations um, in writing. Um, that does not mean that we are not encouraging and providing our thoughts about what we've learned from the history. Um, one of the things that we're obviously um, supportive of, and I feel like sometimes it sounds like it's just because, you know, we want to keep our jobs and it's not. We believe the public history project should continue because we have more work to do. So if you've gone through the gallery, if you've seen the materials, this is not a complete history of the university, not even close. We're very honest about that. We have a, a multi-word document, like it's a multi-page word document full of ideas of what we want to research next things that we didn't have a chance to research. These ideas came from our community members who want us to look into these things. And not only do we wanna keep doing research, but we wanna be able to keep doing things like this, right? To have these conversations about what our history is and what it means. Um, so that's obviously one of our very pressing recommendations. Um, but we wanna also be here so I think consult in that way, right? That I think one of the things that's been interesting about this project is History does not provide a step-by-step -step guide for how to change the future. And people kind of expect it to. And so when you provide these histories, like those in Sifting and Reckoning, people leave and they're like, well, now what, right? And sometimes it's really clear, right? And other times it's not. And so I think one of the harder parts and one of the more nebulous parts is how do we institutionalize our history? How do we make sure that it's not only accessible, but that it's in all of our meetings, it's in all of our department units, it's, it's at the table with us when we're making decisions. And that's not something that institutions do well um, or regularly. So we're kind of like writing the roadmap as well and we wanna be here to keep doing that. Thank you for that, because it also spoke to a question that was submitted virtually. What's next after the public history project, and how do we continue reckoning with our history here at UW-Madison? So I think you spoke to that as well. Um, hello? Oh, there he is. So this is sort of off that, that same question, um, 
because and and also kind of on the theme, one of the themes from the the Go Big Read book about um, symbolic history versus like literal history. Um, I I imagine you you found lots of information, and I'm curious what your process was about selecting the stories to share. Um, and you did as best you could to to choose as many. I'm curious how how much was left out, and how did you try to incorporate that still into the the story? Taylor loves talking about curation, so I'm gonna scoot it to Taylor. <laughs> I do love talking about curation. Um, there were a lot of stories that were left out, either for logistical reasons or for reasons kind of beyond our control, uh, kind of the, the restraints of the archive or the, the other various uh, ways of research and that we um, conducted. Um, I think the, the primary way that we selected what was gonna go in the physical gallery space um, was through something called the big idea. A big idea is something that all museum curators work off of. I kind of talk about it as a sort of thesis statement for the exhibit. What do you want museum patrons who are going, moving through the space to ultimately get from their experience in the gallery? And so our big idea was really focusing on marginalized students, staff, and faculty here and thinking about the ways that they persisted or resisted discrimination, um, even though it was constantly happening to them, right, in, in a kind of roundabout way. And so we, there were certain stories that certainly had um, very immense kind of influence on the campus community and the culture and environment here, but didn't really center those marginalized student staff and faculty that we really wanted to make a point and be intentional about centering. So for example, Casey mentioned like the uh, Ku Klux Klan organizations, right? If you have gone throughout the exhibition, the physical exhibition space, you'll notice that it's not on the walls. And that was intentional, right? Because obviously those organizations existing and having legacies on campus definitely contributed to people having, um, being excluded or feeling like this was an unwelcoming place. But that story really doesn't center marginalized people, right? It centers white supremacist violence. It centers things that we're trying to move away from. But we still wanted it to be accessible as information to our community. And so we utilize things like our gallery book, um, which our small print version is available to take out of the gallery. We have a large print version available to use within the gallery. That information is still accessible in that way and also on our digital exhibition website. So we, we definitely utilized um, the digital exhibition website as well as a way to get as many, literally shove as many histories um, out there because we, we did, we, Casey talked about um, this idea that if this story doesn't get told here, does it ever? So we really wanted to take advantage of all the ways that we could tell these histories and put them um, and make them accessible to the campus community. And the website was really one way. Um, there were certain stories that we really wanted to include, but unfortunately couldn't because we just didn't have enough information, specifically with faculty and staff stories. Um, those were stories that we really uh, wanted more of in the gallery and we wanted to research more of. Um, but because we relied so heavily on our UW Medicine archives, which are very rich, um, but a lot of those faculty and staff um, cases of discrimination and inclusion and how they're resisting it aren't, don't end up in the archive unless they reach like national media attention or they sue the university, right? Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't really account for those daily kind of HR things that we don't have access to as researchers. Um, and so with those stories, we may have like one or two sentences about them um, that really doesn't get at the nuance about how people uh, were resisting or what their experiences were. So we kind of had to opt out of, of publicizing that with trying to be respectful of folks' experiences and how they wanted their story to be shared and told. Um, and so that was another way that we, um, if we didn't have enough information to do it justice, we kind of tabled it for further investigation. And that's, we talk about all the time what we want to 
primarily focus on if the project does continue, and we, we definitely want to find other ways to capture those kind of stories as well. I wanted to share one thing that our table talked about was those of us who went felt that it was really important to go with other people um, and allow yourself processing time afterwards. Um, I went because a coworker said he went alone and needed people to talk to about it. And so then we ended up putting out on our organization intranet opportunities to just come together in community. And we've got multiple opportunities for our coworkers to do that together. Having participated in one of those, it was super powerful. It took like an hour to go through the exhibit. We talked for at least a half an hour and could have gone on more. And then all the groups that are doing that are at our organization are coming together for a couple like lunch and learn kind of talks for further debriefing because it just, so those of you who haven't gone yet, I encourage you to find a group of people to go with and uh, further the conversation. Thank you for going as a group too. That's so special. And it, it really is, if we're thinking about the campus environment as a community thing, it's important to kind of process both by yourself, but also with community, right? We don't exist just um, as individuals. We exist with, in connection with other people. So I think it is really important to talk about those with other folks. Um, I have, if no one else in the room has questions um, at the moment, we have two really great questions that I wanna get to that were submitted virtually. Um, the first is, at a staff discussion, we were wondering if parts of the physical exhibit could have homes or residences in places like the Cole Center, Camp Randall, the Wisconsin Union, et cetera, to prolong exposure for those who are new to UW years from now. A website is nice, but the physical space has more impact. It does, period. <laughs> um, we have a lot of data about this, actually, just anecdotal data, anecdotal data but also I mean, literal web data. So we know that most people spend anywhere from 45 minutes to three to five hours in the exhibit. Um, you can spend a lot of time in the exhibit if you want. The longest time that people spend on our website is 20 minutes. The average web visitor spends three to five minutes on our website. It's just not the same form of engagement. Um, it was really surprising. We did like a preview of the exhibit three days before it opened with um, student leaders from the Multicultural Student Center. The first question they asked was, why isn't the exhibit permanent? And we were all kind of like, oh, <laughs> that's a really good question. Because um, <laughs> we were so focused on like, it has to be open on September 12th that, you know, all these years had led to this opening um, that we didn't think like, what happens December 24th? Um, and we've been having ongoing conversations with the university about the possibility of finding a permanent space for the exhibit um, and or finding multiple spaces for it to exist where that history makes the most sense. So we've been having really great conversations with students from um, ASM, the Associated Students of Madison, who would like some of the history about student orgs to be in the Student Activity Center where a lot of the student orgs have um, offices and gathering spaces. Um, so we're continuing those conversations and I mean, personally, if the project continues and we can find a permanent space, I think it's a really cool idea to have this as something where you can visit it, where you know, next year when we have a whole new batch of students who come, they will still have access to this physical space that you know, classes that are taught you know, next fall that just happen to not be taught this fall that have related curriculum, they can still go. The one thing that I always add is that, you know, we don't want it to be static. We don't want it to be like this thing preserved in amber, right? And so we talk a lot about if it does find a permanent home, about updating it really regularly, like maybe once a year, um, and just making sure that we're being you know, not only expanding, because like we talked about, we had to cut so many stories, like truly so many stories. So we could update and include a lot more of those stories, but also just being, I think, really reactive to what's going on on campus. I think if you have been at UW for a few years, particularly the past three years that I've been here, there have been multiple high-profile controversies related to history. 
And the fact that we have had the project, I think has been beneficial to have people there to kind of talk about it and to be responsive to it. Um, but also, you know, if we're here, we can do fun things like mini exhibits about the Go Big Read topic, right? Like we can just try and really deepen engagement with history just across the board. But again, we have to be a project and we have to be around to keep doing the work. And I know we are at time, so thank you so much for all your questions and responses. Thank you.